which is really, really important if we're going to start talking about what are men, what's men's role in everything that this whole day is about. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say what a, what a, a privilege and an honor it is to be here. Um, I'm reminded of a bell hooks quote that is actually the only person I quote in my book. And at the time I started writing my book, I wasn't even that down on, on bell hooks, didn't understand bell hooks. And the quote is that, the, I know, right? Um, just pay attention, brother, pay attention. <laughs> is, is that the first, first act of violence that patriarchy expects of men is not, of males, is not violence against women. It's, it's an act of so, so, psychic self-mutilation that patriarchy asks of men of boys, excuse me. And if boys don't do it to themselves, we will enact rituals that do it for them. And sports is one of those rituals. Why everything that you heard Dawn talking about, why it's so difficult to gain that respect, so difficult to get that, that platform, is because men still think that sports is the dominion of men. And it's why after 27 years of doing this work around gender equity and gender in sports and all the issues around men's violence against women, um, the only thing, the thing that I, I shouldn't say the only thing, the thing I get quoted most in saying is that we don't raise boys to be men, we raise boys not to be women or gay men because we're not telling boys what to be in their whole selves, we're just telling them what not to be. Don't be a sissy, don't be all the sexist and homophobic derogatory words that we use. That is the ritual. That is a deliberate and intentional way in which boys are raised to maintain patriarchy, to maintain that power and control. So when we talk, start talking about what's the role of men, what feels a little, not odd, but funny being here is that I'm usually talking to men about our job, what we need to do. So if you bear with me, what you're going to hear is a little bit of what I talk to men about. Because that, you throw like a girl, the statement that is the title of my book, is saying to boys that women and girls are less than. And that leads to all issues of men's violence against women and all the all issues that you all are talking about so far here this morning. But there's this other part of it, what do boys and men learn? And what we learn and what we're raised on is being emotionally incapable or incompetent. And not just learning that we're incapable of it. And here's the, something that is more recent for me, is that we're unworthy of it. Because when you learn it at an early age, you're not worthy of your emotions. You're not worthy of your feelings. You're not worthy of your, of your emotional authenticity. And what's really damaging about that for so many boys, and ultimately for women and, and, and girls in our lives, is that there's privilege attached to that. To being emotionally uh, incapable and unworthy, as long as we remain silent, the patriarchy will protect us. And so there's a privilege in that silence. And I say all the time that my ultimate privilege as a man is my silence. I don't have to be engaged in the problem. I don't have to be engaged in work. That's why I say, there's a chapter in my book titled 29. I was 29 years old before I heard anyone talk about masculinity or issues of men's violence against women. And that privilege in our silence as men has led to terms like toxic masculinity. Because the only thing that we, and I say we collectively as, as, as a feminist and people who have been doing work around the prevention of men's violence against women, the only thing that we want men to address is the toxicity of masculinity that negatively impacts women's lives. And that is that I'm emotionally incapable, which means I'm not going to even try. And I'm unworthy, which means I don't see the value in it for me. And so that becomes, and I want to address this word, two things. One privilege and the other toxicity, or toxic masculinity. I look at privilege this way. I don't look at privilege as I have something that I have to give up to make space for you so that you can, that's, that's the privilege that we want to fight about. That's why black people, excuse me, white people will get angry if you talk about white privilege. People of means will get angry if you talk about economic privilege. White, white folks will get upset if you talk about, because I didn't work for it, didn't do anything for it. When I look at privilege is what does it keep us from learning? What is it, it kept, my privilege as a man kept me to being 29 years old before I ever considered what it meant to be a man or 29 years old, old before I considered the violence in the lives of, of, of my, my sister, my mother, my daughter, of the women in my lives, in my life at the time. And so what does that privilege keep you from? And what, what that privilege has kept us from as men is the conversation of how do we get better? And we've landed on terms like toxic masculinity. Our privilege is toxic. But here's, just want to address this word toxic for a second. Before we talked about toxic in terms of masculinity or relationships, we talked about toxic in terms of waste. You remove waste. 
Waste is not even good with garbage. We can't do that. If we're going to ask men to be engaged in this, we have to replace it with something. We have to give them something. We can't just extract them. We can't just extract. And I, and I, I spent some time talking to young men on college campus recently, and none of them talked about the word masculinity in any positive terms. And so I talk about aspirational masculinity. What do I want for you? All of the work we've been doing around men's violence against women has been, what do we want men to do for women to protect? But what do we want for men? What do we want for our boys? That they live in a whole, in their whole, let's talk about authenticity, in the whole loving, caring, vulnerable, passive, submissive. That's not my feminine side. That is my wholeness as a man. So what aspirational masculinity is, is it changes the conversation from not at what we're asking men to do for women. What are we asking men to do for ourselves? And how are we as adult men going to help lead the next generation? If I don't see myself as worthy of the qualities that I typically would consider to be women's qualities, being loving, caring, vulnerable, emotional, if I don't see myself as worthy of those qualities, how can I trust or be led by women who exemplify that? And so as we talk, start thinking about in the workplace, in different environments where we need this kinds of social change, it's not just working with our young boys coming up, but it's also how do we talk to men in the workplace? How do we talk to men in other environments that make them understand that we are all, but we know the statistics. We know all the statistics, excuse me, the statistics about women-led businesses. They do better. We know that. We know that because what you all bring to the table is expanding the, 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 the conversation, not shrinking it. And so we have to show what's in it for men in that conversation. And I, and I was talking to um, a group of people when I published my book, and I said, being a whole man, being that authentic, whole, aspirational masculinity is about being vulnerable and caring. And someone said, well, is it being passive and submissive? That's being a real man. I said, aren't you submissive to your God? And then as I got a little bit older and I taught my 16-year-old daughter how to drive, <laughs> talk about being vulnerable. <laughs> and submissive, and, and all those qualities that make you a better person. And so we have to w welcome men into that conversation. And I know that's not a, uh, a conversation that we're used to having, of how do we make spaces for men to have these conversations, but it is critically important if we're going to move this discussion that we get away from terms like toxic masculinity and more, more start moving more towards aspirational masculinity so that we're doing this in a positive and proactive way. And as I said a moment ago, the research is telling us that I've been doing this work for about 27 years now having this conversation, and the more that I talk to young men, the more I realize this generation of young men have only heard their gender of masculinity being referenced with toxic as a prefix. So we have to show them that they are worthy. We have to show them that they are capable. And as I said, it's, it's sometimes it's odd to be in a, in a room like this where all of you all, you all are doing such amazing work that is so far in advance of that sort of that fundamental conversation. But I always say that if you take a, a five-year-old boy and a 50-year-old man and you talk about masculinity, the definition is going to be pretty similar. We're still struggling with being worthy and capable. 